Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannink here with fellow panelist Mario Ramos-Reyes. Today, we discuss Pope Francis's Tradiciones Custodas and its importance, import, sorry, import, for what Emeritus Pope Benedict XVI termed the extraordinary right. Our welcome and returning guest is Father Donald Coster. We are familiar with his role in preparing the traditional Latin Mass National Survey. We begin in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your love and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'll begin with the beginning of things here. Just what does Pope Francis's Tradiciones Custodas say and what restrictions does it enjoin? Uh, the, yes, the restrictions are uh, in a motu proprio, uh, which came out on the 16th of July. And uh, some of the, the, the restrictions include uh, parish masses. Uh, they include uh, the, the bishop's real authority to, uh, to curb what Pope Francis sees as unfortunate developments within the Latin mass. Um, quite a few bishops have invoked Canon 87, uh, which gives them the right in their diocese to implement a, or ignore any motu proprio. And in fact, that's how a lot of the bishops got around the motu proprio by Benedict the 16th in 2007. So uh, I expect that there will be a lot of bishops um, who will, for the good of their faithful, um, not implement many aspects of this motu proprio. All right, that's the, the basic starting point. Now, Mario? Well, um, a question about the authority. How authoritative is the, the, the document, Traditions, Traditiones Custodes? It's, it's, uh, it's very authoritative. However, a motu proprio, for any reason, within the juridical bounds of a diocese can be modified, ignored, or partially implemented. So it, it really uh, begs the question, what's going to happen? For example, uh, one of the first ones to respond was Bishop Cordelione in Los Angeles, uh, in San Francisco. And he, he basically said, business as usual, he's not going to implement the motu proprio. Um, there have been a couple other bishops who have followed his lead, and there were there are probably about 100 bishops worldwide who are still studying, who have given temporary permission and still studying the question. So, uh, among other responses, uh, it might be uh, in the future that this motto proprio simply be replaced by another one. That could happen, um, but again, any motu proprio is like an executive order for a president here in the United States, um, except again, these bishops have absolute authority within their territorial boundaries. They can basically do whatever they want to do. They don't even have to listen to the, to the uh, uh, UCCB or, or the, the, their governing bodies of, of bishops' conferences throughout the world. A bishop in his diocese is the sole legislator. That's uh, important to know. Now, Pope Francis uh, finds that the implementation of the extraordinary right has led to divisiveness. Do you see evidence of this problem? I do, and, and I think he has a point in, in, some, in some sectors. Um, what, what I think is unfortunate is that he is really ignoring all the divisiveness that happened before the motu proprio of 2007 of, of the, the great spectrum within the Novus Ordo that uh, really has from parish to parish uh, pretty marked divisions. So the divisiveness didn't start with the motu proprio. It's been there for a long time. And it had a different origin. 
Exactly. The spirit of Vatican II. So you can take that wherever you want to take it, you know, to the left or to the right or somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, and again, more of it was taken to the far left than to the middle or to the right. Now, this, go ahead, Murray. I'm sorry. I have a question, a follow up of your previous, previous uh, answer. Um, if uh, I, if you ask anyone outside who doesn't know much about canon law, uh, faithful Catholic even don't know much about canon law, and here you saying that uh, the equivalent to this motu proprio is a uh, executive um, order by the president. I mean that's an analogy from the Constitution, um, which means that that executive order override another previous executive order. Now, in the case of a pope, when he says, well, the, uh, there is only one form of the Roman right. So de facto, he is abrogating the previous um, form. Uh, is that assessment accurate or? He's trying to, but you can't. Uh, every canon lawyer I've talked to said that this motive Appropriate couldn't have been uh, written with consultation of a canon lawyer. There's too many holes in it. Um, the other, with uh, what Francis is trying to do, he didn't even mention uh, the the Anglican use, which is another right within the Roman right, um, which doesn't have an editio typica. It wasn't written in Latin. It was written in English for for English speakers. So there's that problem. Um, there's also the neo-catechumenate way, which uh, really they don't use any other prayer in the Missal other than the second Eucharistic prayer. They were warned um, by Renze not to do that, but they're still doing it. Um, so again, there's, there's all these little sub-rights within the Roman Rite, which never existed before. One thing people have to realize uh, is that prior to the 1970 Missal, well, November of 69, which was the liturgical year of 1970, the, the, the Novus Ordo, it's the only missal that didn't refer back to previous missals, didn't refer back to any authority, didn't say uh, that, that, that they were doing this by the authority of, of the bishops and the saints before them. It was a clean break. Um, so the Novus Ordo has a bit of a problem there in that it didn't reference prior missiles, nor try to build on those prior missiles, it deleted whole sections of the mass. So that, again, it's, it wasn't organic. It was very, very contrived and it was um, very much dictatorial. No one was asked, for example, in 1970, which right they would prefer. And in fact, we had two studies, one in 78 and one in 85 conducted by Gallup poll. And they found that 58% uh, of the faithful still wanted the Latin mass in 1978. And it only went down to 53% in 1985, 15 years removed. The, the majority of Catholics still wanted the Latin mass. So a lot of times when, when bishops have told me in the past, that people don't want it. They're trying to have it both ways. They're telling me they, they don't want the Latin mass. And yet they never asked the people back in 1970, what they wanted. Um, let me follow up again. <laughs> um, you, you are saying that, uh, you use the word dictatorial, which is proper in the political scene, because right. if you decide, if you're an executive um, official, executive power, you decide by yourself, you are overriding the legislative, legislative, the legislative power where right. is where sovereignty may uh, reside. Now, but the church is different. Right. The church is where the Pope is the only legislator who can override anything, seems to be. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, he need to take a look at tradition and magisterium and so. So what you are saying that uh, the missile of Paul VI did not refer to previous prior tradition. In that sense, he fall in what we call legal positivism. The law is what it is, and there is no other foundation rather than the law. 
Am I correct in my assessment? Well, even Francis didn't didn't call into doubt what Benedict wrote. Benedict said, and every canonist I've I've talked to say that the, the mass of Pius V, and even further back than Pius V, uh, was never abrogated. And, and so it, it still has the force of law. Um, what the Pope is trying to do is to, to isolate it and or strangle it uh, into certain sectors of, of, of the church. Um, this is unprecedented because again, we've had a continuity from the apostles down till now and it's interesting, we are the only right, there are, I think it's 23 uh, Eastern rites, not one of them have ever uh, imposed a new order of the mass. Not one of them has done what we've done in the Roman rite. And, and my question is, why haven't they done it if it's such a good thing? So the final question. Mm -hmm. So was... Um, these rights were not abrogated because there is no justification in canon law to do that, even right. though the, the O has the sole power to do that because it's based on tradition. In other words, if you can make an analogy with civil order, you say, well, you can have an abortion law or uh, decision, but will never override natural law. Right. And it, it doesn't translate perfectly to, to civil law. Right. It's just an analogy. Analogy, um, yeah. It's an analogy. And for, for the Pope, he's, again, he has he has the power to, to pro promulgate a motu proprio, but the bishops have exclusive power in their own dioceses. So the Pope has always been the first among equals. So, um, a legislative thing like this, which doesn't touch on on morals uh, and and the, the the basis of our theology, um, the Pope really can't touch what Pius V called an immemorial mass. What What do you think, uh, Father? What do you think has prompted this? Uh, distinctive approach to uh, the liturgy. Why, why is it that there's been such a freewheeling uh, approach to the liturgy? And this is really since Vatican II. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've, I've thought about it a lot. I think it's spiritual in nature. And uh, my whole feeling is let both let both the forms and, with, and the Anglican use, we'll add that into, let them all let them all be, be permitted and see what happens. Um, let the people and, and the priests uh, validate which right will continue. And, and I think if that were ever allowed back in 1970, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, in fact, I think the Novus Ordo would be a very small minority of, of masses in, in, in the world. And it's gonna happen by demographics anyway. So I estimate that by 2036 and 15 years, There'll be 2.5 million Catholics worshiping in the old right in this country, even in spite of this, which will be about a little over a third of the Catholics showing up on Sundays. And by 2060, I, from the numbers, it seems like the Novus Ordo will largely disappear. Now, that projection, I, I'm sure, would surprise a great many commentators. Yes. Uh, We've already gone from, my first study was in 2018. We had 150,000 Catholics in 2018. Now we're three years down the road. We have 300,000 Catholics coming. It doubled in three years. I was projecting 23% growth. Now we're getting about 33 to 35% growth. And then the, the Novus Ordo is cratering. Um, it was about a 3% atrophy. Now that's about a 40 to 45% atrophy after the pandemic. Now, uh, we've already worked out some political analogies and we've already uh, indicated that such analogies are very, very rough. But I'm going to have another analogy. <laughs> and I indicate that it's very, very rough. 
Uh, in the political world, in the United States, there seems to be uh, a slight majority that, that favors what is referred to as the liberal approach, but only a slight majority. And I'm inclined to think that it'll be 50-50-ish for the foreseeable future. Uh, and of course, the numbers don't uh, determine what's the best political approach, but nonetheless, I'm inclined to think that it'll be 50-50-ish. Were that to happen with the Novus Ordo and the, the, the Latin Mass and the Extraordinary Rite, as it has been called, uh, would that be so much of a surprise? And, and if it were 50-50, would it make a difference? Yeah, you know, I think that 50-50 won't happen until about 2040. Um, it's not that there won't be people who want the Novus Ordo. There will be. It's that you talk to these young priests, almost none of them, if they had a choice, would offer the new mass. So that's what's going to happen. All the vocations are trending towards the traditional Latin mass. Um, our seminary here in the Diocese of Bridgeport, when I was in the seminary 25 years ago, we always had above 50 seminarians. Now we're struggling to keep around 13 to 15. Um, and this is happening everywhere. So, and, and of those of those 15, 13 want to say the old mass. So uh, it's not just the religious orders producing the, the great numbers of vocations. It's that there's going to be younger priests jumping ship from the Novus Ordo into the traditional Latin Mass. Me, as, as someone who's older, and having said the Mass for 23 years now, in the 90s, I always just thought it was good for my spirituality. Now, having done two national studies, having uh, well over uh, 3,500 3, samples nationwide, <clears throat> I know what's happening. I mean, it, it's, it's phenomenal. The, the growth is beyond my wildest expectations. I, 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 first of all, I wasn't in fa I wasn't necessarily in favor of the Latin Mass taking over. Second of all, I never thought it would happen. But I can't deny what I'm seeing. The birth rate, the birth rate for these women is going up, and the birth rate for Novus Order women is going down. So he who has the most children wins. <laughs> but, but what you attribute that? that uh, young priests are inclined to the Latin mass? You know, I think some of it, it could be attributed to rebelliousness. Um, but I think as a priest, when you start saying the old mass, it elevates you. Um, prayer life got better, um, connected to the church. It, it just... Since it is so organic, it, it gives you that sense of eternity, whereas the new mass does that partially, but not nearly as effectively. What do you uh, make of the uh, uh, claim that the uh, Novus Ordo uh, heightens uh, the act of participation of the laity Whereas, in contrast, the extraordinary right, I guess that's the term I prefer, mm -hmm. reduces their active participation. You know, th this is a very sticky question. I get it all the time. But active participation, as, as, uh, as, as enumerated by all the previous popes, was never quantified by what you were doing at Mass. It was always quantified by how you were participating prayerfully. Uh, how you were participating spiritually. So by that measure, and, and by the amount of people coming, the percentages, the Novus Ordo doesn't have the, the, the active participation in the, in the same measure that the traditional Latin Mass has. Yes, the, the, the Novus Ordo produces fruits, but they're not super abundant. They're, they're, they're very spotty, and the, the trend since 1965 in every sacramental category is down. And the trend in the Latin mass in every statistical category is up. So which one do you want? Do you want to keep going down and keep losing faithful? Or do you want 
to, to try something new in the sense that we're trying something old and trying something new. Now, do you suppose that uh, Francis is just not aware of the sorts of uh, trends and statistics and developments that, that you're citing? Do you suppose he's just not aware of it? No, I think he's very aware. It, it's ideological. And it's, it's a question. I think a lot of these priests, they don't want to admit they were wrong. Um, again, this, this blockade, to me, is definitely spiritual. There's nothing, there's nothing else I can explain it with. No CEO in any corporation would seek to block and or eliminate their, their most profitable product line. Not one. But the Catholic Church seems hell-bent on restricting the one upward-moving sector that they have. Now, now, I, now we have another analogy territory <laughs> that's going to be tricky. Right. We have politics, and now we have oh, business. Go ahead, Mario. No, uh, you, you are saying the growth, you were, were mentioning about the growth uh, is going up 33%. Is that only the United States or um, in Latin America as well? No, it's it's pretty much it's pretty much United States and Europe. Latin America is is slower growth, but I was there for seven years. I was a missionary priest um, in our diocese of Guayaquil. Whenever the people had access to the mass, they came uh, unequivocally. We, we announced, I was down there for a nuptial, a solemn high nuptial in uh, 2019. And we announced we were going to have a Latin mass in a parish literally six hours before it took place. And 250 people showed up. They had never seen it. Th these people in this parish had never seen it before. Now, uh, and then we, we're hearing reports in Mexico. We're hearing reports in Colombia, um, Argentina. Wherever it's offered, the people come in droves. The problem is most of the bishops in Latin America are not giving permission. Uh, why do you suppose that is? Again, it's a mindset that, the, that Latin is bad, the preconciliar church is bad, and we have to stick with Vatican II. I and, see. It, a, and, and one of the big problems with that is there's nothing in light of Vatican II. So it's Vatican II. I... I always tell the younger guys and, and the people I teach, let's look at Vatican II in, in light of the 20 councils before it. Let's look at all of all 21 councils, not just Vatican II. That's the way we'd always done it before. Now it seems as though we're, we, we've, we've gotten amnesia about what went before Vatican II. I have a, a smaller question, and it's a going back to this notion of active participation. We still have a lot of big questions in front of us. Uh, when I was in elementary school, gosh, that must have been <laughs> what, 15, 20 years ago. No, uh, when I was in elementary school, that must have been uh, 65 years ago. Uh, we always had every day in our parish, and the school kids went every day in our parish, uh, of course, the Latin Mass, and we had what was called the Bisa Recitata. Is that still an option? Absolutely is. And there, you know, there have been uh, attempts to, at the Dialogue Mass, it's, it's not very popular around the world, but there are sectors that have it. I'm, I'm not against it. Um, again, we, we, we just have to get back to the point that the, the traditional mass uh, had 80% participation before the council. We're down, uh, I mean, if you want to be generous, we could say 10%. I think it's closer to 7% participation. We were 22% before the, before the virus. Um, and I think that's going to keep trending downward because people are scared of coming back or they just lost the practice. It wasn't that important to them. But across the board, 98 to 99% of Latin masters come to mass every Sunday. Rain, sleet, snow, shine. And if they leave and go on vacation, they find a mass. 
Now, when I was in my 20s and 30s, well, I'm sorry, my 20s, before I became a priest, if I went out of town, I wasn't going to find a mass. I was on vacation. These kids and the young adults are incredibly serious about their faith. Why would we want to curb that? I, I, I don't, it, it defies logic in, in my opinion, what, 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 uh, the big, what Francis is trying to do. Uh, I have a question about what you said, uh, uh, people in, in Latin America here as well, some people reject the Latin. Mm -hmm. Now talking about that language, Uh, some people have argued that Latin is not a sacred language. And so we, by talking about Latin mass, we somehow we are making it as if it is sacred. Is that is the case, do you think? I, I don't think so, because, I mean, it was always, it was always our language. Um, we had some masses in Greek in the beginning, but Latin won out because that was the mass of Peter in Rome. 98% of the church is still Latin, the Latin rite. And I would argue, and something that's almost never talked about, the Tower of Babel. What happened at the Tower of Babel? We were punished, and we speak different languages because of that. Latin reverses the curse. Latin gives us a common language for the whole church. Not English, which is the language of the, of the, of the world right now. Not Spanish, not German, not French. Latin. And back in the day... When priests went to Rome, they could converse with one another. And largely that's gone because almost nobody teaches Latin in their seminaries. Now, this is not a point that we <clears throat> uh, discussed in preparing for our program today. But it's something that from time to time occurs to me. As I understand modern Hebrew, contemporary Hebrew, the official language and the spoken language in Israel, it was almost unknown in the early days leading up to the <clears throat> development of the state of Israel. And a tiny group of people uh, fostered the Hebrew language, a tiny group, mm -hmm. as in maybe 50 or something like that. Right. And, and now it's the, 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 the language of, of Israel. Uh, uh, that's an analogy <laughs> too, yeah. but it's always impressed me. It seems to me that if uh, we, we didn't have such a, what could I call it? Uh, my country, my country, my country attitude. Uh, political attitude uh, that Latin might be able to have the, the same sway, the same influence. And another thing that's ironic, and, and here we are going off into a, a related but different sort of area, uh, in contemporary Latin studies, the idea is to emphasize Latin as spoken Uh, we recently uh, lost uh, Father Reginald Foster, uh, the, the greatest Latinist uh, in, in the Vatican. And uh, a number of students of his have uh, focused really on, first of all, Latin through the ages, Not just the Latin classics, of course the Latin classics, but Latin through the ages. And the importance of actually speaking Latin. Mm -hmm. And we do have something of a precedent with the, the development of modern Hebrew. Yes. And then you get back to Aramaic. Um, so really in the time of our Lord, there were three main languages, which was more the, the classic Greek, uh, Aramaic, and Latin. And you, that, that famous movie by Mel Gibson, uh, The Passion, there's that scene that always sticks out in my mind where uh, Pilate looks at, looks at our Lord and he starts speaking to him in, in, in Aramaic. And our Lord answers, answers him in perfect Latin. And the look on his face, how in the world do you know Latin? But of course, an educated 
an educated Jew at that time would have spoken all three. Just like in Switzerland, most kids start with three languages and then they learn a fourth or fifth in school. It's not, it's not that unusual. It, it's happened in certain societies. Um, but again, it, getting back to the point, we need a universal language that is the benchmark of every Catholic so that we're united and not merely an English speaking or a French speaking or a Spanish speaking church. Mario? Uh, Father, I, I want to touch uh, another issue that I, I read, and it's the issue of Vatican II. Mm -hmm. uh, I read the, I don't know, it's a letter, declaration, what type of document it is, from the superior of SSPX. Right. And it says something like that the Tridentine Mass conveys conception of Christian life and consequently a conception of the Catholic Church that is absolute incompatible with the ecclesiology that emerged from Vatican II. Right. Yeah, now, you know, this, yeah, this kind of statement to me is just confusing, so to say the least. There, there is a there is a movement among priests um, to do a to do a study coming up on just on priests which mass they prefer and then asking them theological questions. Now, even before that study comes out, I can pretty much tell you what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> the theology is going to be very very divergent, and that first question, if it is, do you prefer the traditional mass or do you prefer the Novus Ordo? It's going to be very different. The theology that follows. Because I'm going to tell you my own experience. I have been attending the Latin Mass, and I used to do much more when I live in a different town. Um, but always I run into this conflict. Right. When you just mention your tradition or philosophical tradition or theological tradition, I'm a personalist. I'm a devotee of Jacques Maritain. That was, for some people, anathema. And I always mention the example of Dietrich von Hildebrand, mm -hmm. who was great defender of the Latin liturgy, and he was a wholeheartedly um, a personalist. Mm -hmm. It seems that there is a disconnection or a connection between well, the liturgy on the one hand, Latin Mass, and then you must have only one view in theology. And in the mix of that is the legitimacy of Vatican II. And that is very confusing, not only confusing, discouraging, because I don't see how someone who is faithful to the hermeneutic of continuity cannot be um, well, I, I did, I, the Latin Mass. I, I did it on a smaller scale with that first with that first um, survey. I asked three questions, three doctrinal questions, and the answers are so divergent that it almost seems like there's two different faiths. So when I when when uh, Kara, the 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 polling wing of the Catholic Church in Georgetown, when they asked Catholics in the Novus Ordo parishes if contraception should be allowable, eighty nine percent said yes. Only 11% were against it. If you ask that same question among traditional Latin masters, 99% say it should not be allowed, and only 1% say it should be allowable. If you ask them about gay marriages, 67% of a Novus Ordo congregation will say it's fine, and only 2% of a traditional congregation will say it's fine. If you ask them about the real presence, 70% of Novus Ordo attendees will say it's only a symbol. And 99% of traditional Latin masters will say it is the body and blood of our Lord. So those are not, those are not compatible. They're not even on the same planet. That is such a wide variant. You could see, you know, two to 5% variance, but that is night and day. So something is happening. Something is happening to theology, not just, not just um, personalist versus uh, Aquinas. This is doctrinal. And that's the problem. Uh, the, 
the Latin mass has a wide tent. Dietrich von Hildebrand was not, I didn't know him, but I know Alice von Hildebrand very well. And, and she, is, she is one of the people I respect the most. Dr. Mara, who died in 1999, was a good friend of mine. He was also a personalist. And we would, we would debate in a, a lighthearted way all the time. But we were still in the same tent, still firmly devoted to the Latin mass. And I would never, I would never doubt the doctrinal convictions of Dr. Mara, nor uh, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, von Hildebrand, never. Yes. We invited Dr. Mara here. Um, he spoke about phenomenology. Yes. And that was probably 97. Right. And we were, he was the one who encouraged us to go to Latin Mass. There you go. Yes. And so there was no rupture, so to speak. Rather mm -hmm. than there was very natural way of understanding the tradition of the church. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I'm jumping around, uh, not that high. <laughs> uh, why, why uh, do you suppose? that in certain sectors of uh, those who participate in the Latin Mass, there is a, a real antagonism towards personalism. And <clears throat> even I would say the Thomistic personalism of St. John Paul II, uh, I can see that sort of thing developing in the uh, <clears throat> the Lefebvreists, uh, but I don't see why it should be present uh, anyplace else. Um, yeah, why, do, why do you suppose that's the case? In my experience, it's not that you know it's not that widespread. Um, most most people who go to the Latin Mass are Thomists. Um, but again, there is room for, for other forms of theology that are orthodox. I think overarching in a lot of these questions that I've seen and some of the questions you posted um, about the traditional Latin Mass, when, whenever I discuss religions with others, uh, they usually develop a straw man argument against someone they know is Catholic. Look at him. Look at how immoral he is. Um, you can never judge a religion, much less a right, by people. You have to judge a religion or a right by what fruits come out of that right, what, 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 uh, what truth comes out of that, that religion. So if, you, if you're comparing Catholicism to, to Protestantism, don't judge them on a pastor in Protestantism or a priest in Catholicism. Judge them on the merits of what they teach. And this is the same argument that needs to be applied to the Latin Mass and the Novus Ordo. For every charge, every negative charge you can make against the Latin Mass, it's probably more so in the Novus Ordo. I've been called every sort of name you can imagine. Um, I'm backwards. I'm, I'm rigid. Um, I, I wear a cassock, which goes back to the Middle Ages. How dare I? I mean, you hear all sorts of stuff. That has nothing to do with the, with with the Latin Mass versus the Novus Ordo, not one thing. Again, where is the fruit? I always ask that question, where is the fruit? And how succulent is it? And, and how is the church either growing or retracting? Although, and, and I understand what you're saying, one of the fruits, I think, would be the intellectual vision of the people who are participating in a religion or participating primarily in a, a certain right, their, their intellectual vision, that's a fruit. Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been in four parishes that have both the traditional mass and the Novus Ordo, and I throw this out all the time. I will take a hundred of your best Novus Ordo kids and give them a, a catechism test. You could choose my hundred traditional Latin Mass kids. You don't even you don't even have to choose the best. Choose the hundred worst, and those traditional Latin Mass kids will outperform the Novus Ordo kids every single time. And it's not because they've studied the Baltimore Catechism longer or better. 
it's because the mass changes you. There are, there are degrees of elevation, and I've seen it time and again, the traditional Latin mass elevates far beyond what the Novus Ordo can ever hope to do. The Novus Ordo does it, but not nearly quantitatively in the same measure. Mario? Um, how this change or this uh, motu proprio affected your personal um, ministry? Uh, not, it hasn't affected me so far. Uh, Ca Bishop Caggiano here has given permission to all five parishes um, and the two parishes that were offering it during the week, so seven parishes. But he's going to ha ask for another permission on the 29th of September, which I don't understand. And I don't understand why these bishops need to study this, the, the, this at all. It's been, <laughs> they've had it in their diocese for 14 years. What is there to study? Um, so I think it's almost like a grade school permission slip. They just keep, you know, it's, it's, a, it's to me a bit of a control thing. And I, I don't really understand it. It, it. If the Latin mass isn't working, tell us that and, and, and give us reasons. But don't keep, you know, holding it over our heads that we need to keep asking permission to continue to say the mass that we all love, that we've all seen the fruits that we, you know, when I, when I started the mass here at this parish, it just started in February, we had 15 people. Now we've got 50. It's more than tripled in a few months. Um, the mass in Bridgeport, uh, it's uh, St. Cyril Methodius. They went from 90 and now they have 260 just in three years. Um, uh, again, uh, one, one parish that just flabbergasted me, the cathedral in Austin, when I was going there in the 90s, they had 30 people. Now they have 600 people coming at two separate masses. I mean, this is, and they're, they're flooding in from, from the Novus Ordo uh, because people during the, 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 the virus saw what priests like, I, like me were doing. We were going to people's homes. We were giving people communion. We were having mass. Um, we were there. And largely, Novus Ordo priests, there were exceptions. I, I know the exceptions. But largely, they were locking themselves in the rectory and not taking phone calls. Um, that really hurt the faithful. Another comparison. What about the... Um, liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. We could compare it in different ways. Uh, one way we could compare it is in terms of active participation. Another way we could compare it is in terms of its uh, fostering theological depth. Another way we could compare it is in terms of uh, how it relates to uh, uh, increasing secularization. Uh, another way we could compare it is in terms of uh, growth or decline uh, among uh, the Eastern Orthodox or Byzantine Catholics. Uh, if I had my choice today, I would attend a parish that had uh, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. And for some time I did, but then uh, it seemed to me that the pastor was mistaken on uh, moral questions. And so uh, my wife and I moved to uh, the Latin Mass, and I certainly welcome that, and I would attend that today were it not for a, a very infirm family member that prevents us from really uh, driving it a great distance uh, on Sundays. Uh, so that takes us back to uh, compare and contrast, says the old teacher, <laughs> with respect to points A, B, and C, uh, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom uh, and uh, the Novus Ordo and the Extraordinary Rite. Yeah, so I, I love the, especially the, the Ukrainian Rite and the... Uh... Yes. Maronite right or the two that, that I've gone to the most I went I did go to a Byzantine liturgy a couple times when I was in the seminary because one of our priests was by ritual 
Um, and I was uh, very happy with, with uh, the, 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 the traditional way they, they the say, say mass. Largely, it is the same structure as the Roman rite uh, with a few variances. Uh, but pre-sanctified gifts is, is, is one of the, but you have that during Holy Week uh, in the pre-54 in the Latin rite. Uh, but but again, those those rights are also suffering in this country because uh, once the immigrants get here, they usually assimilate to a different a different area or or they they, they leave altogether. It's it's a somewhat a, a difficult question, especially as, as small as they are. But um, no, I have a great respect for the for those rights. Again, we get back to the fact that the vast majority of people want the mass of St. Peter. Um, and that is, it, as I become more and more convinced, uh, it's not the Tridentine mass. It's the mass of the ages. It's the mass that came to us very nascently from the apostles, just as St. John Chrysostom didn't necessarily invent the Byzantine liturgy. Uh, it came down from St. Bartholomew, we believe. Um, and then you have the, the Cyril Malabar rites of St. Thomas. I mean, all of these were coming from different parts of the world, from the apostles themselves, and what they had seen our Lord celebrate in their presence. It wasn't the Novus Ordo, I guarantee you that. All right. Thank you. Mario? Um, I have a question. Uh, many people have said that the reason why he, the church in general, uh, have some problem with the Latin mass is because the church herself is affected by modernism. Is that is, uh, do, do you see that is a factor among priests so that the doctrine of modernism, which is very broad term, right, um, has affected really the seminary, how people are being taught, uh, the liberal theology that has come out out of um, over the past uh, thirty years or fifty years. Do you think that's also is a factor? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I was in the seminary, several of us uh, took our our more traditional books and put them in the closet so that our formators wouldn't see them. Uh, we were, you know, if you if you were a cassock or if you said the rosary, you were automatically labeled and. A lot of the professors during my time, uh, especially in formation, uh, were very, very hard on guys like me. Um, if, 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 if they thought you were too traditional, uh, they were going to try to bend you back to a more progressive point of view. Hard business, hard business. Now, we... Uh have been through what a lot of people refer to as the liturgical wars. <laughs> uh, we've, we've been in, I don't know now, is it a, it's past a 30-year war? <laughs> must be at least a 50-year war. Uh, how would you see uh, what forms might uh, a thoughtful, honest, uh, ongoing dialogue. Uh, how might that develop? Do you see any examples of it? Uh, yes, and I, I, I would encourage bishops really to to give permission and be like Gamaliel, Acts chapter five. You know, uh, you might find yourself fighting against God, and if it's not of God, it'll die itself. Um, I say I, I, I would love that approach. Let, let the rights alone, let the expressions of the rights alone, and see what happens. See what develops um, organically. And again, with these young families, uh, they have more children, they get five times as much in the collection, uh, they're, they're four times more likely to show up on Sundays. Um, if you rate, here's, here's an incredible stat. I'm a stats guy, I'm not a statistician by trade, I'm an economist, but I love numbers. Oh, that's a grim science. That's a grim, grim science. Don't this deny man. it. If, if, you, if you look at a, at a child from the age of seven and you raise them in the Novus Ordo, they have a 5% chance of continuing as an adult. 
if you raise them in the traditional Latin mass, they have a 98% chance of staying in the faith. That is phenomenal. That, that right there should tell anybody where we need to go. Okay, now here's a, another wrench in the monkey works. <laughs> a monkey into the wrench works. Uh, suppose, what do you think would happen if uh, you were to ask uh, Novus Ordo people and uh, Extraordinary Right people, uh, what do you think about gun control? And what do you think about capital punishment? And what do you think about immigration and uh, wall building? Uh, I've noticed some differences in this area. And uh, uh, in part, this is prompted by my most recent debate. I'm running for governor in California. My most recent debate, uh, well, I'm not running that fast. <laughs> uh, some people have said it's a crawl. <laughs> I anticipate that it will move forward to the level of a scuttle. <laughs> At any rate, when you're in debates, you run into all sorts of people. Last night, I ran into a group of experts, three of whom turned out to be longtime supporters of Lyndon LaRouche. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so we have such a range of, of views. At any rate, suppose we asked uh, these these big families, which I celebrate. Uh, my great student uh, David, who teaches at a, a, a the seminary, not the uh, the Fevre Seminary, but the, the the right sort of seminary, has fifteen children. But God love him, he's uh, turned out to have bumper stickers that tell me that he's. Uh, uh, really camping with the National Rifle Association, uh, which seems to me to be just a huge mistake. And uh, folks who do that ordinarily support Trump, who seems to me to be the personification of a huge mistake and to have done the pro-life uh, movement a great disservice by his character and his, his I think, opportunistic acceptance of the, the pro-life view. So I don't know if you can pull anything coherent out of that. I told you I was running for governor, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I, I would, you know, for me, you're probably correct, but I would try to stay out of politics in the sense that, to me, what matters is how, how people are, are, are voting, quote-unquote, uh, toward the sacraments, how they're voting toward participation in the mass. That, that's far more important to me than any political views they hold. Because at the end of the day, if they get their religion right, it, it, will, it will right their ship no matter what. Uh, maybe it's only slightly, but it will right their ship. Well, that and if they were to read St. John Chrysostom on uh, our obligations to those who are poor and suffering, if they were to read him, they would think, holy moly, because he was an extraordinary advocate on behalf of, of the poor. You know, uh, all, of, all of my public outreach that I did prior to be, becoming a priest, I noticed that the vast majority of people who, for example, volunteered at the soup kitchen, helped the homeless, etc., were traditional Catholics. Ah. I think the liberals have a, have a big mouth, um, a big stage, but they largely, they don't back up their words with their actions. All right. Mario, you're next. And also, since I'm working with a computer that doesn't show me the time, as with last week, you're our timekeeper. So go ahead. Um, how do you see yourself um, Ten years from now, in uh, offering the Latin Mass. No, I was. It's funny you said that. I, I was just talking with a few people the other day, and I said, in ten years, I'll still be offering the old Mass. Um, in ten years, uh, we, the Latin Mass will have expanded even more. This is not something any one pope or bishop uh, can can stop. 
the inertia is too great. So that this uh, motu proprio, to great extent, um, began a huge dialogue between people, and people get noticed that there is such a thing in Latin mass out there. Right. Do you see that way? Absolutely. And you know, places like San Antonio, Texas, he's going to probably uh, rest he's probably going to very greatly restrict it. And I think they only have two masses. I think he'll make it no masses in San Antonio. But Austin is going going about as normal. In fact, they're about to implement another parish that's going to say the mass in Austin, and that's right adjacent to San Antonio. So you're going to see certain dioceses outlaw it, but you're going to see other dioceses just like happened just in June, a month before the motu proprio. The Bishop of Dijon kicked the fraternity out of his, out of his diocese as of September. The next week, two neighboring bishops invited the fraternity in. So this is what's going to happen. It's going to be a type of pollinization uh, uh, from bishops who are friendly to the mass. And then the bishops who are persecuting the mass will also help in that the traditional mass will undergo suffering, which will breed fruit. I imagine our former guest, Bishop Strickland, will <laughs> have an approach that differs from that of the bishop in San Antonio. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, going back to one of my earlier questions, you did say that there are problems with divisiveness on the part of, let's say, at least the rhetoric of people who are associated with the traditional Latin mass. Uh, maybe we could be specific. What would you think about a site like Rorate Chile? Rorate Chile has a lot of really good pieces on it. Um, I have tremendous respect for, for the editors. Um, again, you're not going to get everything right. Nobody does. No site gets everything right. Uh, and again, I, I, I think there are you know, places like America Magazine, which gets very little right, and nobody really comments about them. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I comment on how I never read it anymore. Okay. But, but again, it, it's not just one-sided, and that's, that's what we have to keep focusing on. Yes, there are people who make mistakes, who, who throw out invectives, who impugn others, but that, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the fruitfulness or fruitlessness of where the church needs to go and how she needs to pro progress to, to have the greatest amount of people worship at the altar. And I don't, and like, like a, a man said this in Arkansas to, to, to Bishop McDonald at the time when I was asking permission to say mass for 90 people and McDonald wouldn't allow, allow it. There, uh, this guy was not even a Latin master. He looked at our Archbishop McDonald and says, Excellency, I don't care if Father Kloster says the mass in, in, in Martian. We want a mass. We've not had a mass in two and a half years. Um, why is it that you'll allow a Spanish mass, but not a Latin mass in our parish? Because Father's the only one that's offered to come and say mass for us. So now we're coming to the position where it's turned around, where in France I've heard um, the, the people were complaining that the two Latin mass priests were assigned to their parish. They said, we don't want Latin mass. We, 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 we're not affiliated with the Latin mass. The bishop said, they're the only two priests I have to send. Be thankful you're getting two priests in your parish because you haven't had a, a, a resident pastor in four, four and a half years. So now that now the table's turned and one, once all these ordinations come online, it, that's what's going to start happening because you got to get priests from somewhere. Now, in discussing these questions, so uh, for what must be getting on close to an hour, you've shown remarkable good humor. Uh, and yet you admit to being an economist. <laughs> <laughs> How is it that you maintain this good humor? The only thing that keeps me sane is the humor is the humor. All right. That's a good sign right there. What little sanity I have left. Ah, <laughs> that's not such a good sign. <laughs> Did I tell you that the campaign is looking for a director of communications? You're, I'm your man. I'm your man. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mario, your turn. Well, my final question. Um, 
Do you, do you have any information, anecdotal information, as to how this decision has impacted the uh, seminarians who are uh, studying um, in whether they would like or not to offer the Latin mass or were discouraged and decided to leave or something of that sort? No, I think initially people were shocked. They were wondering what was going to happen, but most of the, most of the seminarians I'm talking to now, they're not worried. They know that, that God will protect what is his. I think also the understanding of just what a motu proprio is and what it isn't, and the authority of the bishop within his own diocese, those are very important considerations that are, are not always understood. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the wandering mind. In many ways, I admire Pope Francis. I certainly admire his position on nuclear weapons. I uh, strongly admire that. I admire his constant uh, calling to attention, uh, calling our attention to the, the tragedy of, of the poor and his calling our attention to the worldwide church. We've had people, Christians from Pakistan on the show before, and I think you could live in the United States your whole life twice over and never give a thought to the struggle of, of Catholics in Pakistan. And, and I think with this Pope, you would have to give a thought to it if you're paying any attention at all. But I, I bemoan, I bemoan press conferences, especially if they're on airplanes. And I, I think perhaps that motu proprios ought to be very limited. <laughs> they're way up from airplane press conferences. But given their, their limitations, I think they ought to be used very sparingly and back to an analogy which is going to limp and limp badly. The same with executive orders in, in the political sector, few and far between. Very true. Anything to add, Mario? Uh, no, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> All right. Well, what's not done and what's sharper than any two-edged sword is the word of God. And so we have the gospel from today, a short gospel from Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in the field, which a person finds and hides again, and out of joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field again. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he finds a pearl of great price, he goes and sells all that he has and buys it. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father, for joining us. You must be very busy these days. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank all you right. very much. Godspeed. Yep.